As we learned in the previous video, getting good is the inevitable reward, I repeat, inevitable reward, for replacing a very short list of unproductive habits with a very short list of productive study and practice habits. So, what are these highly effective and efficient study and practice habits? Well, I have, I have a list. Here's my top eight. I'm going to read them to you so I don't mess it up. One, stop wasting time. Two, study and practice in small doses repeated often. Three, quality first, quantity second. Four, record everything. Five, divide and conquer. Six, slow things down. Seven, play with a metronome or a rhythm track. And eight, rehearse mentally away from the piano. By the way, I made myself a card to remind myself to do these things each and every day. You might want to make one yourself and put it on the piano. It's like having a coach there just constantly reminding you to do the right thing. And now for the good stuff. There's a lot more to these habits than meets the eye. And that's what the rest of this video is all about. Let's go. Habit number one, stop wasting time. By the way, I was trying to think of how to say this in more positive terms, like use your time wisely. But you know, I think it's way more effective to get the point across by scolding ourselves with three exclamation points and say, stop wasting time. So how do we waste time? I can think of at least four very common ways. Time waster number one, studying and practicing music that we do not love to play and that we have no intentions of keeping in our repertoire. Time waster number two, mindlessly practicing stuff that we already know how to play. A specific example of this is always starting at the very beginning of the piece, no matter what, even though the thing we really need to work on is somewhere on page two or three. Time waster number three, the horrible, horrible habit of always going back to the beginning of a piece when we make a mistake. Time waster number four, studying and practicing stuff that does not help us perform better. A real good example of this is doing mindless mechanical exercises. Right? We do this all the time. The bottom line is this. If you want to get good at Bach, study Bach. If you want to get good at jazz, study jazz. There is where you're going to find the musical patterns and the technical problems that are particular to the kinds of music that you want to play. Habit number two. Study and practice in small doses repeated often. In other words, doing a little bit every day beats doing a lot of bit once a week. And so why is this so important? Well, first of all, realize that cramming is inefficient because your brain is like a sponge. And like a sponge, it can absorb only so much so fast before it becomes saturated. And the second thing is, when you go to sleep, your brain does an amazing thing. It automatically stores what you studied and practiced that day in your long-term memory. And so if you study and practice every day, you are taking full advantage of each and every sleep to make your musical mind grow. Habit number three, quality first, quantity second. In other words, study first, 
practice second. In other, other words, repetition, physical repetition is important, but only after, I emphasize, only after you have studied the music using all four of your musical intelligences. Remember these guys? Ears, intellect, eyes, and muscles. Let's take a look at each of these four in turn. Ears. When you play music, you don't want to just be merely playing symbols, S-Y-M-B-O-L-S, symbols. You want to be playing sounds that you hear in your mind's ear. And by the way, very importantly, you don't merely want to play these sounds accurately. You want to play them expressively. And by the way, you'd be absolutely amazed at how having a very crisp and clear intention of the sounds you want to make will transform the quality of your performance. Intellect. You want to use your knowledge of music theory to discover the patterns in the music you're learning. In doing so, instead of just brute force memorization note by note without any musical understanding at all, you're going to come to deeply understand the music you're playing as complete and meaningful musical ideas. Eyes. You want to have a crystal clear visuospatial image of the arrangement and sequence of the keys on the keyboard. Not one note at a time, but as a complete and coherent musical pattern. Muscles. Make sure you're using a fingering that makes both physical and mental sense. And also make sure that you discover a choreography that allows you to fluidly express the musical intentions you have in your mind's ear. Right? Of course, supplemented by your knowledge of music theory and your visuospatial awareness of the keys on the keyboard. And then and only then should you do mindful repetitions in order to render that physical motion automatic. Habit number four, record everything. Listen to the playback immediately and ask yourself, is that what you intended to play? And you got to pay attention to everything. You know, the accuracy of the notes and the rests, uh, whether your rhythm is in a groove, whether you're speeding up or slowing down unnecessarily, whether there are unintended accents or any hesitations that suggest you're not quite sure of what the music's doing, and whether your dynamics and phrasing and articulations are as you intended to play them. And if you find that there's something you're unhappy with, do something constructive with what you just learned. By the way, if you are an imperfect human being, like me, you just might discover that you hear and feel some things during the playback that you did not notice while you were playing. And even though this can be quite the humbling experience, realize this. I, I cannot think of enough superlatives to convey just how important this kind of feedback is to developing your self-awareness and to elevating your standards of what it means to play like a real musician. Habit number five, divide and conquer. Let's begin with a couple of realizations and we'll talk some more. Do you ever notice that you can typically play the first few measures or first few lines of a piece so much better than the rest? And also, did you notice when a piece is difficult to play, 
it's not typically because the piece is uniformly difficult to play. There's usually, you know, one or maybe a handful of particular spots that are causing you trouble. And so if you want to get good, you absolutely must break the horrible, horrible time-wasting habit of always practicing, air quotes, practicing the piece starting at the beginning. And then you must stop compounding that horrible habit with yet another horrible habit of going along just fine until you make a mistake. And then what do you do? You go back to the beginning, playing through it again, hoping by some miracle that it's going to work out the second time around. The solution, of course, is to break each piece into sections and then each section into phrases and each phrase into subphrases and so on as, as far as you need to go in order to break the music up into digestible chunks that you can then study and practice accordingly. So what does digestible mean? Digestible means small enough for us to pay full attention to everything we need to pay attention to. In other words, small enough to fit into our short-term working memories where we can study and absorb the music using all four of our musical intelligences. Remember those? Ears, intellect, eyes, and muscles. And when you've identified a weak area, you must go after each and every insecurity like a brain surgeon, where no detail is too small. Every note, every rest, every fingering, every articulation, every gesture. In fact, for particularly difficult spots, we might have to break the music down into a digestible chunk no bigger than a single chord or a single transition or a single beat. Another way to divide and conquer that might be appropriate is to study and practice each hand separately. Right, if there's some music that's particularly troublesome, this allows us to give our full attention to each hand where we can focus on everything using our, what? Our four intelligences, right? Ears, intellect, eyes, and muscles. I can think of at least two huge benefits of dividing and conquering. Benefit number one, instead of just one memory trigger point, at the beginning, you will have multiple memory trigger points distributed throughout the piece. And therefore, you will be able to play the piece starting anywhere with the same competence and confidence as if you were starting at the beginning. And benefit number two is you're going to learn a lot more music in a lot less time. And a way to think about this is suppose the piece took five minutes to play but that you had a problem area that was five seconds long. Well, the beauty is you could play that five second long piece 12 times in the span of one minute instead of just mindlessly, quote, practicing the entire piece one time in five minutes. Habit number six. Slow things down. How slow is slow, you might ask? Well, slow enough to pay attention to everything using our four musical intelligences. In other words, slowly enough to be aware of the sounds we are making, right? Slowly enough to be able to think about the patterns we are playing using our knowledge of music theory. 
slowly enough to see the arrangement and sequence of notes on the keyboard and slowly enough to be aware of our fingering and the sensations in our muscles as we play. And finally, slow enough, this is a huge one, slow enough to play accurately, making sure we've got the right notes and the right rhythms and a fluid, natural choreography. I can think of at least five huge benefits of slowing things down. Benefit number one, slow practicing gives your four musical intelligences time to be fully conscious of what your brain is doing. Benefit number two, slow playing gives you enough time to always play accurately, which is absolutely essential for training your brain to move your muscles repeatedly and reliably. Benefit number three, slow practicing exposes every mental and physical insecurity. Things that might easily go unnoticed at performance tempo. Benefit number four. Because you have a lot of time to think about what you're doing, slow playing is a great way to test whether or not you really do know everything you think you know about a piece. And benefit number five. Slow playing allows enough soak time for the information in your short-term memory to transfer to your long-term memory, where it can become permanent. And so you just might discover practicing that way that you have memorized a piece without even trying. Habit number seven, play with a metronome or a rhythm track. And by the way, you don't have to do this. I wouldn't recommend you do this all the time. But if you're playing the right notes, but the music just doesn't seem to flow somehow, you almost assuredly have one or all of the following three problems. One, you don't have a clear mental conception of how you want the music to sound and feel. Or you have a misconception or misperception of where the notes are. You know, you think a note is, quote, here in the meter when it really belongs somewhere else. And the third problem is that there's a hitch. There's some kind of awkwardness or tension in your physical execution that is distorting your rhythmic timing. And so to that end, playing with a metronome goes, or a rhythm track goes a long way to helping you expose and diagnose what the problem is so that you can go after that problem with all the other study and practice habits that we talked about. By the way, you might also supplement playing with the metronome or the rhythm track by doing at least six other things that'll really help you internalize the rhythm. Number one, count the meter out loud. For example, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one, etc. Number two, scatting the rhythm of the music you're playing. So for example, for s slow triple feel blues, you might go, Number three, sway your body or bob your head or tap your feet or do all three. Number four, 
Number four, combine this with slow playing. Number five, playing one hand at a time while clapping time on your lap with your non-playing hand. Let's see how it goes. And number six, record yourself. But when you listen to the playback, Step away from the piano and see if you can sway or stroll or swagger or march or dance to the music you just made. Let's give it a go. Let's see what happened. Now, if you heard what I heard, I still have a little bit of tightening up to do on that thing rhythmically. All that said, I leave you with a word of caution. Even though the metronome or a rhythm track can be a great tool to help us diagnose a misconception in rhythm, don't allow it to become a tyrant. Lots of musics really need to have an ebb and flow of the time in order to be expressed musically and artistically. And so once you've got the accuracy of the notes and the placement of the notes and the meter down, right, it's perfectly okay to abandon the metronome or the rhythm track and go beyond mere robotic precision to the realm of artistic expression. Habit number eight. Rehearse mentally away from the piano. Once you become familiar with a piece, give this a go. Close your eyes and imagine everything about it in your musical mind using all four musical intelligences. So let's imagine the sounds we want to make in our mind's ear. Let's imagine the musical patterns using our knowledge of music theory. Let's imagine the visuospatial arrangement and sequence of notes on the keyboard in our mind's eye. And let's imagine the fingering and choreography and the sensation of our muscles and our kinesthetic intelligence. Wow, this is, this is something else. This is quite an experience, and it's an extremely effective way to study because it requires us to slow down and really concentrate. And by the way, it has the added advantage of that it enables us to study almost any time and anywhere, even without a piano. I would like to close this video out with three words of encouragement. Number one, even though it took us a long time to talk about all these effective study and practice habits, it doesn't take long at all for us to actually practice them. In fact, we can practice most of them simultaneously and in the span of only a few heartbeats. Number two, 
If you make these highly effective and efficient study and practice habits a regular part of your study and practice sessions, not only will you elevate the quality of your playing, but you're going to learn a lot more music in a lot less time. And you're going to transform your entire relationship with music. Instead of frustration and self-doubt, you're going to be filled with conviction and competence and confidence. Confidence. And, uh, you know, when you see the results, the results will speak for themselves and be self-motivating. Number three, and finally, each of these study and practice habits is quite simple, actually quite ordinary, and easy to do. The problem, though, is that they're also easy not to do, right? And so this is the chasm we have to cross if we want to get good. How do we do that? Realize that the discipline required to actually practice these habits is not a talent. It's a choice that's available to each and every one of us at this very moment. Mm -hmm.